Greetings, and welcome to Etzheim's weekly podcast, recorded live in Richardson, Texas. We invite you now to join us for one of our synagogue's Shabbat messages. Well, Shabbat Shalom. We're continuing in our series on the book of Romans. Today is part 18, and we're going to look today at Romans chapter 11 and the culmination of God's end-time purposes for Israel and the nations. If you remember, Paul ended Romans chapter 10 by grieving over Israel's national rejection of the Messiah at the time. Uh, And then he opens chapter 11 like this, Romans 11, uh, beginning in verse 1. I ask then, did God reject his people? By no means. I'm an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. God did not reject his people whom he foreknew. Don't you know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah? How he appealed to God against Israel? Lord, they've killed your prophets and torn down your altars. I'm the only one left, and they're trying to kill me. And what was God's answer to him? I've reserved for myself 7,000 who've not bowed the knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there's a remnant chosen by grace. And if by grace, then it cannot be based on works. If it were, grace would no longer be grace. So the question Paul's addressing here is in light of Israel's rejection of Yeshua for the most part, Does this mean that God has rejected them? Are they no longer God's covenant people, God's chosen people? Here we have the evil roots of replacement theology and anti-Semitic teaching that God's done with the Jewish people uh, and the Abrahamic and Mosaic covenant, that they've come to an end and the Torah has been abolished and God has replaced Israel with the church. And indeed, this has been and still is the doctrine of much of Christianity today, including the official doctrine of the Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church and the Church of Christ, and the unofficial doctrine of many of the Presbyterian and Episcopal, Methodist, Lutheran, Brethren of Christ, and Disciple of Christ churches. But what does Paul say? He says, by no means. No, God has not rejected his chosen people. He's not abandoned Israel. He's always preserved a remnant whether it's the 7,000 prophets in Elijah's day, or the first century believers in Paul's day, or the modern Messianic Jewish movement in our day. God is faithful to his covenant, whether we're faithful or not. He will never break his eternal covenant with Abraham and Moses and David. Uh, He's always had a faithful remnant of believing Jews in every generation who respond to him and his promises in faith. That's Chaim. We are part of that remnant today. Our existence testifies to God's faithfulness. He has not rejected his people. And he's not replaced them with a new entity called the church. God is still dealing with national corporate Israel, who are beloved for the Father's sake, as well as dealing with the body of Messiah, consisting of true Yeshua followers from both Israel and the nations. So the Lord continues to work on this twofold track of national Israel and the multinational body of Messiah until all Israel shall be saved. So in these first six verses, we see that like the nation in in Elijah's day, so Israel in Paul's day was unfaithful to God. Our people had forsaken the mediator of the covenant, Yeshua, the Messiah. Yet a remnant had nonetheless joined themselves to Yeshua, espoused themselves to him, if you will, in faith. And this remnant, like the remnant in every generation, was a sign of hope that the whole nation would one day come to a saving knowledge and trust in Yeshua, her long-lost brother and Lord and Messianic King. Verse 7, Romans eleven seven. What then? What the people of Israel sought so earnestly that they did not obtain, but those who were chosen obtained it, and the rest were hardened. Israel as a nation did not attain to the righteousness based on faith, for she sought it based on her flesh, but the remnant did obtain this righteousness. Uh, But this hardening of of the majority of the nations, as we'll see, of of the nation, is only partial, only a partial hardening. It's not final. Those who are hardened can be softened. Those who rejected Messiah can be turned to faith. Indeed, we read this in Ezekiel 36, 25. 
Uh, that in the last days, the Lord says this to Israel, I'll sprinkle clean water on you and you'll be clean. I'll cleanse you from all your impurities and all your idols. I'll give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I'll remove from you your hard heart, your heart of stone, and give you a heart of flesh. And I'll put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. This day is coming. And we, at time, we're to be salt and light to our people to help prepare the way. Verse 8, as it's written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that couldn't see and ears that couldn't hear to this very day. And David says, may their table become a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a retribution for, uh, for them. May their eyes be darkened so they cannot see and their backs bent forever. Again, I ask, did they stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? Not at all. Rather, because of their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel jealous. Notice that what the enemy meant for evil, the majority of our Jewish people rejecting Messiah, God used for good. Israel's transgression led to the gospel going to the Gentiles and the Gentile salvation and will also be used for Israel's eventual salvation because the redeemed Gentiles are to make the Jews jealous and bring them back to their own Jewish Messiah. Now, let me put that on the overhead. How do the Gentiles, or how are the Gentiles supposed to make Israel jealous so as to motivate them to return to the Lord? I think in three ways. First, when unsaved Jews see Gentiles on fire for the Lord, See, their changed life, uh, their godly lifestyle, living in holiness, showing supernatural love for others, self-sacrificially serving their neighbors, walking in in humility and kindness, exhibiting joy and peace, uh, their face shining with the light of Messiah, uh, their whole being pulsating with the presence of the Holy Spirit. Jews will see this. Uh, They will notice this. And they will want this. I know this was true in my own life. I was living a secular life. There was one guy in my college fraternity who who was noticeably different. He was the only born-again believer in the frat. He made me jealous. I wanted the, the joy and the love and the peace that he had. The spirit within him called out to me and made me jealous. He lived a set apart life and I noticed his higher standard. I wanted to know his secret. I wanted to know his God. Second, Gentiles make our people jealous when the Jewish people see the Gentiles worshiping their God, leaving behind their paganism and worshiping the one true God of Israel. And Israel sees the Gentiles being blessed by and receiving the mercies of the Lord God Almighty. Jeremiah 31, 31, God promises a new covenant to the house of Israel and the house of Judah, whereby he'd write the Torah on their hearts and cause them to know the Lord. And the Gentiles, through faith in Yeshua, now have been grafted into this new covenant and its promises. Although the new covenant was initially promised only to Israel, Israel will see in the head that God has now expanded it uh, to the nations as well, uh, who now receive the new covenant blessings and mercies, which Israel itself has not received apart from Messiah, and it will make them jealous. Israel will see this uh, and and, and seek to regain the mercies and blessings of God as well. This will stir Israel to repent, repent of her disbelief and her disobedience, and turn back to the Lord. But here's the third way that the Gentiles are to make Israel jealous, uh, that they've missed uh, up till now. The Jewish people were to see the Gentile believers the Messianic Gentiles, that they not only loved Israel as God, but they loved the nation of Israel. They loved the Jews as God's chosen people. And they loved the laws and life cycles that God gave to Israel as pointing the way to Messiah. Therefore, to the extent that the Christian church has been and remains anti-Israel, such as supporting the BDS boycott movement, and anti-Semitic, as in the historic inquisitions and crusades and pogroms and persecutions and holocaust, and anti-Torah, 
teaching replacement theology and the Torah has been done away with, to the extent the church fails to be used as God's means to bring Israel itself to jealousy, to that extent the church is failing. Therefore, to the extent the church has disregarded or despised God's people, God's land, and or God's word, she will fail to enter into all of God's blessings and fail to fulfill her calling to make Israel jealous. Indeed, for 2,000 years, the church has had no substantial positive effect upon Israel, but rather has been her enemy, an opponent, and persecutor, has preached heretical doctrines of of antinomianism and and replacement theology, and has, uh, has had an ungodly attitude of superiority and triumphalism and arrogance towards Israel, exactly contrary to Paul's warnings and admonitions here in Romans 11. But in the end, the fullness of the Gentiles will come in, followed by Israel's national salvation. I believe this fullness means not only the full number, but also the fullness of the Gentiles' calling to love the Jewish people, uh, to love God's people, and to live out a Messianic Jewish life cycle, honoring the God of Israel and his Shabbats and his appointed times, and that this is part of what will finally make Israel jealous. And indeed, the good news is is that in these last days, we're seeing God's people turning back to the Torah uh, and Shabbat and God's holy days, his appointed times. And this will in turn begin to affect the rising of the dawn of Israel's awakening. This is the calling of the Messianic movement. This is our calling. The groundswell of interest in, in the Jewish roots of the faith today It's no mere accident or coincidence, but it's a sovereign move of God in these last days to restore the body of Messiah to its original roots so that it may fulfill its divine calling uh, to make Israel jealous, leading to that last great Jewish revival and the return of the Messiah. So EC, be encouraged. God is at work to begin softening Israel's heart preparing her for the return of her Messiah. Romans 11, verse 12. Now, if there, if Israel's transgression uh, be riches for the world, and their failure be riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their fulfillment be? Paul says that the restoration, the fulfillment of Israel, will for the believing Gentiles exceed in blessing what they've experienced apart from Israel's ingathering. That is, the full blessing that God intends for the nations, for the Gentile believer, for the Messianic Gentiles, this full blessing cannot be realized apart from Israel's salvation. May the Christian church begin to understand this promise. If Israel's transgressions be riches for the Gentiles, allowing the gospel to go out to the nations, then Kol Homer, how much more will, will, will a blessing will it be to the Gentiles uh, will, for Israel and Israel's fulfillness? Will, Israel's fulfillness and restoration will be even greater blessing. So let's recap the role of the Gentiles. I'll put this on the overhead, as seen in Romans 11. Number one, the Jews' rejection of the Messiah meant salvation for the Gentiles. Number two, Paul himself demonstrates this in his own ministry. In every town, he always goes first to the synagogue. And only when they reject the message does he go to the Gentiles. Number three, the Gentiles are the wild olive branches and should not be arrogant toward the natural branches. Number four, the Gentiles' role is to make the Jews jealous, especially through their love of the Jewish people, the land of Israel, and God's Torah, and living out a messianic lifestyle of honoring Shabbat and the biblical holy days. And number five, when Israel returns... It'll be an amazing new level of blessing for the whole world. It'll be like life from the dead. Verse 13, Paul says, But I'm speaking to you who are Gentiles, inasmuch as I'm the apostle to the Gentiles. And I magnify my ministry, if somehow I might move to jealousy my fellow countrymen and save some of them. Even though Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles, he always obeyed the doctrine of Romans 1, 16 and 17, that in fulfilling the Great Commission, the gospel is to go to the Jew first. And that needs to be our priority as well. 
And note again the central position that Israel plays in the overall scope of God's plan for mankind. Paul saw each Messianic Jewish believer as a foretaste or first fruits of the final redemption in which Israel as a whole uh, would come to saving faith in Yeshua. Verse 15, Romans eleven fifteen, For if their rejection brought reconciliation to the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? If Israel's rejection of Messiah was used to bring salvation to the Gentiles, how much greater blessing will Israel's acceptance of their Messiah bring? If the ingathering of the nations is proof that God is keeping his covenant promises to Abraham, uh, Genesis 12, 3, in your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Then the blessing that comes upon the natural seed of Abraham, the Jewish people, will likewise, and even to a greater extent, show forth God's covenant faithfulness. Indeed, the salvation of Israel will bring forth supernatural resurrection power. It'll be life from the dead. So try to fathom uh, this massive, magnificent call upon Israel. Israel's place in God's plan of redemption is so significant that even their negative action released upon the nations the greatest positive blessing of all time, the reconciliation of the world to God. Uh, The calling upon the Jewish people is so great that even their initial rejection of Yeshua allowed the entire world to accept him and be blessed beyond measure. Israel's temporary failure opened the door for the entire world to be reconciled to God. And if their rejection unleashed such a profound blessing, what will happen when Israel turns to their Messiah? The ball game will be over. It'll release such resurrection power on this earth that it'll mean life from the dead. When Yeshua finished his atoning death on the cross, there was such power released upon the earth that the dead rose from their graves, we're told, and walked the streets of Jerusalem. So look at Matthew 27 and 51. It says, at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook. The rocks split. The tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had, who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tomb after Yeshua's resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. Can you even imagine this sight? Uh, did people who were dead for years completely freak out their families by suddenly showing up for dinner? And Paul says the same resurrection power is going to be released again when Israel accepts their Messiah. This is why uh, the coming Messianic Jewish revival, which we're called to be a part of, will be the revival to end all revivals. Hallelujah. Verse 16. And if the first piece of dough be holy, the whole batch is also. And if the root be holy, the branches are too. Paul's reference here is based on Numbers 15 and the requirement to separate part of the challah from the bread that's baked from the grain harvested in the land, and present this as a first fruits offering to the Lord, which was then given to the priests to eat, and this sanctified the rest of the grain harvest. This separated bread offered to the Lord and given to the priests, it was considered holy. No one else was allowed to eat of it. And not only was this, this priestly offering holy, but it also sanctified the rest of the grain harvest for the whole nation as well. This first piece of dough was considered a first fruits offering. So how is Paul using this metaphor? This first lump of dough has been seen, we'll put this on the overhead, to represent either, number one, the the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, number two, the Messianic Jewish believers of the remnant, or three, Yeshua, the Messiah. Although most commentators agree that here Paul is using this imagery to refer to option number two, the Messianic Jewish believers, the believing remnant within Israel. They are the first lump of dough, the first piece of challah, the first fruits of of Yeshua faith offering up to to the Lord from Israel, which then allows the remaining nation, those currently existing in unbelief, to be accepted as sanctified in the sense of set apart to God as the object of his faithfulness. God remains faithful to his chosen people, even when they are not faithful to him. Thus Paul exhorts his Gentile believers 
to consider the Messianic Jewish believing remnant uh, to be a foreshadowing, uh, a down payment, if you will, of the final and ultimate fulfillment of God's promise to save the entire nation of Israel. Um, and if the root be holy, the branches are too. And the biblical scholars put so the overhead debate the meaning of, of, of who the root is in this metaphor. Again, the options being, number one, the patriarchs, number two, the Messianic Jewish remnant, and number three, Yeshua. Most scholars interpret the root to be the patriarchs, Abraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov. Paul is here referring to God's national covenant with Israel. To understand Romans chapters 9 to 11, we must realize Paul's often discussing things uh, on this two-track system of election. One is the national calling of corporate Israel that remains in effect whether or not Israel has yet come to faith in Yeshua as their Messiah. They are God's national covenant uh, promises that were made to them uh, through the patriarchs. It's first set forth in Genesis, first set forth in Genesis 12, uh, verse 2, where God tells Abraham, I'll make you a great nation. Uh, I'll bless you. I'll make your name great and your name a blessing. You'll be a blessing. And I'll bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. And all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. This is the Abrahamic covenant. And it's unconditional. It's not conditioned on Israel's obedience. It includes the promise of the land of Israel uh, and making them a great nation. There's also God's spiritual blessings and citizenship in the eternal kingdom of God that he promised to the faithful remnant within Israel who put their trust in the Lord and his Messiah and thus enter into the new covenant promised in Jeremiah 31 and now extended to the nations. In this way, all the families of the earth are blessed through Abraham uh, and become not his physical, but become his spiritual children, the spiritual children of Abraham. Now, if we don't recognize this twofold use of Israel in, in the book of Romans, and especially Romans 9, 10, and 11, we won't understand much of what Paul is saying. So here in Romans eleven sixteen, the root are the patriarchs, Abraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And through their holiness, they preserve and sanctify the branches uh, of the rest of Israel in the sense that God is faithful to his covenant promises. The patriarchs are the root in the sense that they represent the covenant first established with Abraham and his seed and then reconfirmed in, in, in uh, Isaac and Jacob to prove the, the ongoing viability of the covenant in spite of our people's sins. So we and then I have us on the overhead here. The, the root that represents the covenant on the same two levels of the seed of Abraham that Paul has already alluded to. Number one, uh, the root represents the physical seed of Abraham within the scope of, of Earth's history, whereby God made national ethnic Israel his chosen people. And number two, the seed of Abraham uh, to eternal life of, of the believing remnant within Israel and to all those from the nations who would join themselves and be grafted into the rich root of the natural olive tree of Israel. National ethnic Israel, the physical members of, of the Abrahamic covenant, have promised to them God's temporal blessings within the scope of earth's history. A great name, multiplied seed, a blessing of those who bless, cursing of those who curse. The physical seed of Abraham is also given the land of Israel, uh, the temple service, the holy scriptures, the Hebrew scriptures. But Paul also says that not all Israel are Israel. Not all of physical Israel automatically share in the spiritual promises of eternal life. But only the believing remnant who truly put their faith in God and in Yeshua, his Messiah. And thus, the, and thus the natural branches can be cut off because of their unbelief. And the wild olive branches from the nations can be grafted in based on their faith. Thus fulfilling the final Abrahamic promise that all the nations of the earth will be blessed through you. But Paul also emphasizes that the, the cut off natural branches, they can repent. They can return to the Lord, trust in Yeshua, and be regrafted back in again. By seeing the root as the patriarchs, representing the Abrahamic covenant, accommodates this twofold prophetic understanding of Paul's brilliant use of, the, of this powerful metaphor. This understanding is faithful to the gospel, that salvation is only by grace through faith for both Israel and the nations, while at the same time not negating God's sovereign choice of national Israel as his covenant people. 
and thus avoiding the, the heresy of replacement theology. These two levels, uh, the temporal blessing and the eternal blessing, both function within different aspects of the Abrahamic covenant, which rightfully sees Israel as God's chosen covenant people, but at the same time allowing for a breaking off and a grafting in of the wild olive branches and a regrafting in of the natural branches. But please note that for Paul, the culmination of the Abrahamic covenant, the eternal blessings of God's kingdom, which centers squarely on Yeshua, the Jewish Messiah, this can never be realized apart from the nation of Israel. Yeshua is returning to Jerusalem to redeem his people. They'll look upon the one whom they've pierced uh, and they'll call out to him in faith. But thus the maintenance and the, and the redemption of the nation of Israel is, is integral to the covenant as a whole. Now, throughout church history, many Christians have argued that, that once Messiah has come, that the nation of Israel, through which he came, became superfluous. But to combat it, this wrong mentality is the very reason that Paul is writing to the Romans, to rebuke such arrogance. For Paul, Israel is not only necessary to bring the Messiah, but also to prove Messiah's integrity, and that he's able to complete the mission for which he came. God is faithful, and he proves it through his faithfulness to Israel. Thus, any theology that teaches Israel's final and ultimate failure, or that she ceased to have a central role in God's plan of redemption, makes God a liar. It is a theology of error, which Paul says is born of arrogance. Indeed, Paul exhorts the Gentile believers to see Israel not as their enemy, but as beloved, even as God himself calls Israel his beloved. Uh, and the unity of the engrafted wild branches with the believing natural branches emphasizes another important truth. In God's plan of redemption, hear me well, the natural branches set the agenda. That is, the worship and life which the new covenant uh, uh, is, is to be all about, such as Shabbat and the Moedim and God's appointed times, uh, is to be that which is prescribed by God for Israel. And so and those grafted into Israel are meant to, to take up this agenda. Look at the metaphor Paul uses of the olive tree. We'll put this on the overhead. Uh, the tree produces the same fruit in both the natural and the grafted in branches. The wild branches, grafted in against nature, produce the same fruit as the natural branches, not vice versa. The natural, branch, the natural olives don't become wild. Uh, the wild branches, uh, after being grafted in, uh, don't change the tree into a fig tree or a date tree. Put this on the overhead as well. The tree remains an olive tree, uh, and the engrafted in branches are expected to produce olives. Why? Because the root governs what the tree produces. The branches cannot be arrogant towards the root if they intend to bear fruit. For it's from the root that the nourishment for fruit production comes. And that attests to the foundational Jewishness of Yeshua faith. The olive tree, in Paul's metaphor, is a Jewish tree. Thus, the grafted in branches don't become something new or different. Rather, they participate in the covenant God established with Abraham and the patriarchs, and the wild branches become spiritual children of Abraham. Indeed, we read this in Isaiah 56, verse 3. God says, Let no foreigners who bound themselves to the Lord Say, the Lord will surely exclude me from his people. For this is what the Lord says. The foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord, to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants, all those who keep Shabbat without desecrating it, who hold fast to my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house will be called a house of prayer for all the nations. But here's the challenge today. Can the grafted in branches envision themselves being satisfied and fulfilled with the worship prescribed by the God of Israel? Can their eyes ever be cast towards Jerusalem, waiting, longing, hoping, can the wild branches have a heart for the place and the people for whom God has set his name forever? 
so much so that the worship and the service to the king cannot be thought of apart from it, from this name and this place. For the Lord says that in the millennial kingdom, all the nations uh, will go up, not to Rome, uh, not to Mecca, but to Jerusalem to worship the Lord at Sukkot. And God says to, said to Israel, after promising them the new covenant, he says this, look at Jeremiah 31, 35. Right after the promise of the new covenant, he says, this is what the Lord says, who appoints the sun to shine by day, who decrees the moon and the stars to shine by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. The Lord Almighty is his name. Only if these decrees vanish from my sight, declares the Lord, will the descendants of Israel ever cease to be a nation before me. This is what the Lord says. Only the heavens above can be measured, and the foundations of the earth below searched out. Will I reject all the descendants of Israel because of all they've done, declares the Lord. Israel is central to God's plan. But today, uh, in the modern, in modern Christianity, uh, the grafted-in branches often feel no need for the root. Much of Christian theology today uh, turns Paul's metaphor on its head, where the branches take over the root, and the new covenant is seen as abolishing all the prior covenants. So in this misconstrued mentality, the original root is no longer needed. This was Paul's warning 2,000 years ago, and it's proved tragically to be well-founded. And it's resulted in 2,000 years of Christian anti-Semitism. So we'll put this on the overhead. No longer do Gentile believers view themselves as, as, the, as the wild olive branches. Uh, in their mind, they've replaced Israel. They've become the natural branches. Rather than seeing themselves as participants in, in the richness of the root, they built for themselves a new tree in which they've now become the root. And out of the very arrogance against the natural branches that Paul warns against uh, has come a theology that despises the root and functions like an ax to topple the ancient tree. And we wonder why that the church has failed so miserably to make the Jews jealous. When God's root is despised, the body of Messiah cannot accomplish its great commission. But in these last days, things are changing. God uh, has, has resurrected in this last generation the modern messianic movement of Jews and Gentiles returning to the original first century Jewish roots of the faith. This is an amazing end times move of God, and he has called us to be a part of it. Verse 17, Romans eleven seventeen. 17. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you being a wild olive were grafted in among them and became partakers of the rich root of the, of the olive tree, don't be arrogant toward the branches. But if you are arrogant, remember, it's not you who supports the root, but the root who supports you. Paul's warning the Gentile believers not to be arrogant towards the natural branches, meaning don't be arrogant toward either the believing or the non-believing Jews. And the believing Gentile's failure to heed this warning has been the blackest mark in all of church history. But in emphasizing that the original natural root supports the wild branches, Paul was dealing here a fatal blow to all forms of anti-Semitism and replacement theology. It may be that the Lord uses the Messianic movement to help gently and lovingly overcome this culturally ingrained arrogance within much of the body of Messiah, so ingrained over century after century that today they're largely blind to it. We can help show a better way, returning to the original roots of the faith, as long as we remain humble and don't become arrogant as well. Thus, there is no room for church bashing within the Messianic movement. These are our brothers in the faith, our brothers in Messiah. Now, notice this phrase that the root supports you. The picture here is that the root of the tree supports the branches and gives the tree its ability to stand. If the root is removed, the tree falls. In Paul's analogy, the arrogance of the, of the wild branches, the Gentile believers, is seen when they say, we no longer need or want the root. The Abrahamic covenant, the patriarchs, is, is carried down through the generations by the nation of Israel. The arrogance Paul's warning about 
is when Gentile Christians say they no longer need or want a connection to biblical Judaism or the physical people of Israel. But Paul's pointing out that the wild branches grafted into the natural tree cannot partake of the rich sap and nourishment of the tree without abiding in the root that produced the natural branches in the first place. So Paul's warning the Gentile believers not to separate themselves from the natural branches or from the Jewish roots of the faith. And God has supernaturally raised up the Messianic movement within the last 50 years to address this issue and to restore the body of Messiah back to the ancient paths of the original Yeshua followers of the first century, who, by the way, were all faithful Jews. Verse 19. You'll say then, branches are broken off so that I might be grafted in. Quite right. They were broken off for their unbelief. But you stand by your faith. Don't be conceited, but fear. Yes, in the mystery of God's providence, he used Israel's rejection of Yeshua to take the gospel to the Gentiles, But Paul here now warns the Gentiles not to therefore assume that God has rejected Israel, which Paul is going out of his way to refute. Look at also how self-centered is the heart of this Gentile position of replacement theology. Branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. It's all about me. It's like the Pharisee in Luke 19 who said, thank God I'm not a sinner like that publican. The Gentile who has this arrogant attitude also fails to recognize that one of the purposes for why he's grafted in is to make Israel jealous, to provoke them to jealousy, so so that they might seek to be restored to their Messiah. This arrogant attitude also fails to remember that his very own salvation is only by God's grace, not by his own works that he should boast, Paul unveils the mystery that the Gentiles grafting in is not only for their own eternal salvation, but also to help bring Israel back. Paul also warns the Gentile believers here that they stand only by their continued faith through God's grace. And since faith is the deciding factor, any feelings of complacency or superiority are completely out of place. The only proper response to God's grace is one of humility, not arrogance. That's why Paul says, don't be conceited, but fear. Pride is the response of a depraved heart. Fear fear of God is the response of a crucified heart. Pride is inconsistent with true saving faith. To be proud over one's faith is to negate it altogether. Whereas fear of the Lord is the very essence of faith. Verse 21. For if God didn't spare the natural branches, he won't spare you either. Behold them, the kindness and the severity of God. To those who fell, severity. But to you, God's kindness. If you continue in his kindness, otherwise you also will be cut off. Paul says if God was severe to the natural branches due to their unbelief, He'll surely be severe with you wild branches if you show yourself to be without real faith by your arrogance and conceit. Faith is the key. And biblically, faith is always shown by faithfulness. It's it's to this faithfulness that Paul is now calling the Gentiles uh, who confess Yeshua, the Jewish Messiah, as their Lord. Verse 23. And they also, if they don't continue in their unbelief, they also will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. Paul here makes it clear that God's able to bring the natural branches back in again through faith in Yeshua. Their separation is not necessarily permanent. God leaves room for repentance and restoration and reconciliation and redemption. And the implication here is not just that God's able to do it, but that he will do this. And Paul calls the Gentile believers uh, to live in this expectation of of this miracle. The days of Israel's hardening will come to an end. Verse 24. If you were cut off from what's by nature a wild olive tree and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more would those who are the natural branches be grafted into 
their own olive tree. Notice Paul's classic a Jewish form of argumentation here, kova homer, how much more so? If God can graft a wild branch into a cultivated tree, how much more can he regraft in a natural branch into their own olive tree? Again, note all the families of the earth are blessed through God's covenant with Abraham and the Jewish people. Thus, when a Jewish, a per, a Jewish person receives Yeshua as his Messiah, he does not convert to another religion. Rather, he's regrafted back into his own tree. Verse 25, For I don't want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, so that you won't be wise in your own estimation, that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. By mystery, Paul means something contained in the Hebrew Scriptures and in seed form, but now revealed more fully in the coming of Messiah. You know, messianic prophecies aren't always immediately self-evident in all their details when they're first given. But once fulfilled, uh, you can then look back and see how it was all there all the time uh, in hindsight. Thus, divine revelation progressively unfolds over time. And we'll put this on the overhead. This Paul here is, reveals a threefold process in salvation history. Number one, a, a partial hardening of Israel, followed by number two, the fullness of the Gentiles coming in and resulting ultimately in number three, all Israel being saved. And Paul wants the Gentiles to understand their role in helping to lead towards Israel's ultimate redemption, which would also result uh, in a humble attitude by Gentile believers, not an arrogant one. Now, scholars debate what the fullness of the Gentiles means, put this on the overhead, uh, but, and, and whether it refers to, to uh, quantity, a, num a certain number of Gentiles, or of quality, the Gentiles recognizing their role as part of the natural olive tree and living a lifestyle of love and, and service and humility and evangelism uh, and honoring of the Jewish roots that will make Israel jealous. And I don't think it has to be either or. I think it's both and. Thus, it can mean a full number of Gentiles being saved from every people and tribe and tongue and ethnic group. And it can also mean the Gentile body of Messiah returning to a vibrant, radical, self-sacrificial faith and to the original Jewish roots of the faith so as to make Israel jealous. So we see the following. It hit us on the overhead. Uh, number one, a judicial hardening. Israel's hardening is not arbitrary, but it's due to their unbelief. Number two, the hardening is partial. A remnant is saved in every generation and more and more so today with the rise of the modern messianic movement. And number three, the hardening is temporary, not permanent. Israel can still repent and return to the Lord. And Paul, in fact, tells us in 2 Corinthians 3 that whenever a Jew comes to Yeshua, the veil over their eyes is lifted. And then finally, number four, in Romans eleven twenty six, God promises one day all Israel shall be saved. And so we read this in Romans eleven twenty six. And so all Israel shall be saved, just as it's, as it's written. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. There's much discussion over what's meant by this phrase, all Israel. Uh, but it seems to mean uh, the nation as a whole, although not necessarily every single individual member, uh, who are alive when Yeshua returns. And we read about this national turning in Zechariah chapters 12 and 13. So we read this in Zechariah 12, 10. And the Lord says, I will pour out on the house of David, on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, a spirit of grace and supplication. They'll look on me, the one they pierced, and they'll mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn. On that day, a fountain will be opened for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and impurity. Indeed, this is the conclusion of Jeremiah's new covenant. Look at Jeremiah 31, 34. For, if, uh, for I'll forgive their iniquity and their sin. I'll remember no more. Israel's future promised redemption is ushered in by her final acceptance of Yeshua as her true Messiah. So we read now Romans eleven twenty eight. 28. From the standpoint of the gospel, they're enemies for your sake. But from the standpoint of God's choice, they're beloved for the sake of the fathers. For the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. 
even though Israel as a nation is presently antagonistic toward the gospel, they're still God's chosen, chosen nation and are therefore beloved, beloved of God. And we should therefore, uh, uh, and, 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 and all who therefore are beloved, uh, who claim God as well, uh, should, should love them as well as followers of God. Be beloved by all who claim to love God and follow God. And Israel will indeed come to repentance and espouse Yeshua as her messianic bridegroom. Thus, while Israel may temporarily be the enemy of the gospel, even as Paul himself was at one time, she will return to her Messiah and be eternally loved by the Lord because he is a faithful covenant keeper. Romans 11.30 For just as you were once disobedient to God, but now have been shown mercy because of, of their disobedience, so these also now have been disobedient, that because of the mercy shown to you, they also may now be shown mercy. For God has shut up all in disobedience so that he may show mercy to all. Paul recaps here, saying that Israel's disobedience has brought the ingathering of the Gentiles, which will bring Israel to jealousy and to repentance, by which she too will receive the mercies of God. And in light of all of this, Paul ends with this stirring hymn of praise to God. Look at Romans 11, 33. Of the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has been his counselor? Who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and pray. I want to call the music team up, and let's, let's, let's pray together. Oh, Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your covenant faithfulness to your chosen people, the people of Israel. We thank you that even when, when we are unfaithful, you remain faithful. And we look forward to the day you promised when all your people would look upon you, Yeshua, the one they've pierced, and mourn for you as one mourns for an only son, and weep bitterly and come back to you in brokenness and repentance and in national repentance and call upon you, Yeshua, in faith. And thus in that day you promise all Israel shall be saved. But until that day, Lord, help us, your people, to be about your business, to get the Messianic movement back moving again, be in your harvest field, uh, seeking uh, to, say, to, to uh, seek and save the lost. Show us, Lord, how to make your people jealous, uh, how to live lives filled with your supernatural love for others, how to reach out in compassion to the lost, uh, how to walk in the fruits of your spirit, how to be empowered and anointed by your spirit, uh, living within us, conforming us to your image. So, Lord, we pray for divine appointments, we pray for divine encounters, even this week, where we can share our testimony with someone who doesn't yet know you. We pray that you will use us to help regraft in the natural branches back into their own olive tree. And to be a positive example also to the wild branches of the Jewish roots of the faith. To encourage them not to be arrogant towards the natural branches. For we all stand or fall, Lord Yeshua, only by your grace. And we have nothing to boast in ourselves uh, or boast in against anyone else. Oh, the depth of the riches, of the wisdom and knowledge of God. Lord, how unsearchable are your judgments. How unfathomable are your ways. For from you and through you and to you are all things. To you, Yeshua, be the glory forever. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Shabbat shalom.